You're listening to Trace Elements Radio. We are on um, Revolution Radio Studio A. We need to talk about what's going on in Canada. Now, I don't know if you've heard specifically this, but on one reserve, on one, there were 11 attempts of suicide on Saturday. And then Monday, another one. What we're seeing in Canada right now, we've talked about before, but I have to take you back and show you how this started. This reserve which we've heard of before has the De Beers Victor diamond mine on its lap. They were given 10.5 million dollar trust fund these people. There is connection to the neurotoxins the mercury being produced by this mine and the mental health of the people who live there. That is what's not being spoken of. What we are seeing, and this is global. No, this is global, but it's happening here. Epidemic. We are talking about the merchants of death. This is the corporate financed Holocaust that's going on all over the world, especially the Anglo Gold Ashanti. This is a mining conglomerate. Oppenheimer's, De Vere's. We will hear about a lot of things talking about this. Of course, the majority of people who are going to be blaming what's going on. We'll talk again about Jews. You know, Americans like to uh, blame the Jews. But we'll, we'll pick this apart piece by piece. Now, Atahuapiscat has now been declared official emergency. Canadians are going to be talking about it. There's um, a big meeting tonight. They will do nothing, because this is about mining. Canada has the worst mining abuses all over the world, right up there with the other ones. Now, the increasing number of young people attempting suicide, especially in remote northern First Nations communities, are epidemic. We've talked about this before, but this is becoming ridiculous. And we're talking about people under 13 and over 80. These are people who have multiple health conditions as well. Now you will probably say to me, you know, there's a lot of, there's a drug epidemic there, which is true. Horrific health problems there, which is true. But when we are talking about a home to around 2,000 people, and in March, we spoke to you about this Creek community that saw 28 young people trying to take their own lives. There are layers of grief, obviously. When anyone dies of illness or old age, and it's a complicated grief, there's severe trauma, like when someone commits suicide. These things that are happening are happening for a reason. They're happening because well, 
poverty. Let's talk about poverty. Because the mental strain of living in poverty and thinking constantly about tight finances drops a person's IQ. We're not talking about just losing a night's sleep here. Think about losing a night's sleep or pulling an all-nighter but for seven generations. It's obviously these people aren't getting the money supposedly given to their band councils but unfortunately band councils are hand-picked not by the people but by the government. Canadian government will never do anything to stop mining. That will not happen. If you think it will, you're deluded. Now, I want to go back a little bit to something we had talked about years ago. and um, Chief Charles Tudok and I had spoken of this. We know there's a horrific amount of contaminated sites in Canada. As a matter of fact, there are more than 10,000 sites that the federal government calls contaminated that need to be remediated. I love their words. But they still need to be assessed, cleaned up, simply have a pollution contained, monitored. I have an article from, I think we first did it in 2008 and updated it 2014. Now, Environment Canada ministers a program that covers a network of sites that pose risks to human health, the environment. The greater the risk, the greater the urgency for action. Now, according to 2013 public accounts. The federal government has set aside $4.9 billion for its contaminated site. But this report concluded that because there are so many sites that have not been assessed, nor have they been cleaned up, that the bill is going to be higher. That means the government's total liability for contaminated sites is around seven billion in 2013. So you'd think that they would be stopping, slowing down. They are not stopping or slowing down any of this. Now, as we had said before, and I need to say this again, many of these sites are located in cities. This is leaking into the drinking water. Other sites, for some reason, they call historic, like Kingston Penitentiary. Now, the Correctional Service of, of Canada closed it September, I think, 2013 began decommissioning that in November, but what do you do when it's a city? What do you do when it's a reservation? What do you do? You close your eyes. Now there are 1,248 active contaminated sites in Canada that are being assessed right now. Active. Most of these are reserves, reservations, polluted by petroleum products where the oil has spilled, where batteries containing other PCBs, other chemicals have leaked into the soil. Many of these polluted sites are in northern Canada, risk to animals, polar bears, caribou, that ingest these chemicals, get into the food chain, and people who live north hunt. 
they eat them. Now, we go to the giant mine in Yellowknife as one case in point. And of course, most people have never heard of any of these things. Assessed at $900 million, the bill to clean this up. Two days before Christmas, Aboriginal Affairs quietly announced that it would act on most of the recommendations, but saying that not all of the pollution can even be cleaned up, and in many instances, which is a very broad term, means putting a fence around the site. That's our idea of cleaning. Or putting some plastic liners around the site. And then the process of ongoing monitoring for decades, even centuries, goes on down the road. And when they've seen the contamination, of course, they don't stop. They haven't stopped. At all. So, De Beers, let's talk about this. Because the Ontario government has not monitored the mercury risk that's going on everywhere that De Beers touches in lands that were pristine, beautiful. Now mercury contamination from De Beers diamond mine, one case in point, in northern Ontario is much higher than the company or the provincial government has ever reported. This is a new study by the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society's Wildlands League. De Beers, of course, denies the allegation, saying in a statement, it's environmental. Data is often being misrepresented by other parties, like people who are dying from their contamination. There has been calls for independent environmental monitoring for years. For years. Of course, that's not being done. Now, the key concept is that an open pit mine located on a fragile ecosystem like James Bay lowland is contributing to the contamination of methyl mercury, a neurotoxin by the way that accumulates in fish and any other food sources that the people on that land eat. And not only are these people being allowed well they're not people it's a corporation they're being allowed to expand they're being allowed to do their own studies De Beers has failed to report five out of nine surface water monitoring stations which is mandatory by the way and for the last seven years these failures to report important downstream results Apparently the ministry is shocked by this. Gaps in the reporting by De Beers are extensive, persistent, and this is what they do all over the world. Now let's go back. Let's go back to 2013, where there was unprecedented flooding reported in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, northern Quebec, and northern and central Ontario. Aboriginal bands, entire municipalities, declared states of emergency, just like what we're seeing now. Now, due to location of First Nation settlements, they've always had problems. Because, um, Many have no roads going in, and people can't be evacuated. Now, Attawapiskat First Nation, that declared an emergency on April 30th, 2013, after sewage backed up, 
close both the hospital and the school. Sewage actually going into the homes. And this was reported as early as 2009. Ongoing without stopping. So many of the First Nations communities have a state of emergency firmly in process, not because of suicides, which is major, but because of the water, which we've told you about. Now, the Apwatascat communities called a housing emergency in 2011. The Harper government and the De Beers Diamonds responded with three old trailers. Guess where they got these trailers? Take a wild guess. Can you guess? The trailers that were used in the United States from another emergency and those trailers were contaminated. Yes, of course, I'm thinking of Louisiana. Now, then the government tried to take over the band's finances, stopped in court. Chief Teresa Spence, remember her, who began a fast December 2012, calling for Canada to honor its treaties with First Nations. Her understrike was only ended by the First Nations' concern and government's promises to talk about this. In fact, Canada has become the third largest producer of diamonds globally. And the circumstances of local people never improve. And in other regions, corporations extract uranium, gas, oil, gold, etc. without any responsibility to the land's inhabitants, aboriginal or settler. Now, for example, the Nesk Tegabent called a state of emergency April 17, 2013. CBC gave the band, whose population is um, around 400. Again, there were reports of 10 suicide attempts in a month out of some 400 people. Health Canada refused the band's request for help for a drug treatment program, mental health counseling, and no one has discussed the lack of safe drinking water, which has been confirmed. This is not even a speculation. They know the water is contaminated. The water is contaminated because of mining and extraction practices. Now there, specifically, there was a Northern Ontario chromite mining and a boiling water emergency. Actually, that one had gone on for seven years in 2013. It is still ongoing. Has named two companies attempting to expand in the area at the time. So a Cleveland U.S. based Cliffs Natural Resources interested in Enchromite and a Detroit based interested in nickel copper. The band of course only has partial control of its finances and know for a fact that the government will respond as with Apwadiska by taking over, putting in their own guys. So in January 2013, an interview with a CBC former Liberal Prime Minister, Paul Martin, faulted Conservative government's treatment of Native peoples and its attempt to legislate Aboriginal land without any consent. Well, they can recognize Canada's residential school programs as cultural genocide if they like. Government's attempts to create Aboriginal school boards, which is racist in its very name, throughout Canada, was abandoned, actually, when Harper's Conservative government came to power. But this is never stopped. In Northern Ontario, 
the difficulty remains that most people are expendable to mining and resource interests. Anyone who wants the land is taking it, have taken it, continue to take it. Our people are endangered, but it's not just flooding here. It's the lack of potable or portable water. It's drug abuse rates. It's suicide rates. It's diabetes amongst Aboriginal people who are not eating what they're supposed to eat. Our food. The food from the land. We can't eat that because the animals are poisoned. Native groups have been engineered into situations of terminal health. Physically, mentally, psychologically. Mercury poisoning. Now the resources of the land provide minerals, gems, of enough value to plan, sustain, care for, protect every single person up there. But because the resources are stolen from the people, the land doesn't sustain them anymore. They are vulnerable to man-made or natural disasters. No one admits that the European concepts of dwellings and common space that apply to native people in regions of extreme climates fail every time. Natural disasters such as flooding point to the wisdom of migratory lifestyles which we had here. This place is not Europe. We can never live by European laws on this continent if we are going to survive. As a people, I'm talking about everybody now, we have to move. This is what this place demands. So European answers apply to First Nations needs with a contempt, well, with a focus on only making profit. Well, failing to provide a sound location for long-term settlement which we didn't have because you can't have it on this continent. We have winter. We have changing migration. We have a lot of things that you can't do living in one place all the time. You can't provide proper infrastructure of water and sewage. You fail to provide communities with the means of self-sufficiency, healthy food sources, self-sustaining industry, employment, the ability to purchase food. So it is an inevitable result of Europeans' cultures, governments, planning and funding was only going to eradicate a people. Flooding is a state of this land. This is why we knew to move. But what if James Bay region were populated by those in power? For instance, the land's wealth of resources and technology now would be available to produce flood safe European towns on steel pilings with escalators to the front door year-round gardens under thermal bubbles, which we have for communications, lots of bicycles. Brazil could create an entire city of Brasilia. Flooding is affecting non-banned communities throughout Ontario as well. What we have here all across North America Settler communities and First Nations communities have been stripped of their inheritance. Live amid the mercy of what's left. Cultural genocide against the First Peoples, it's a metaphor for what really happens in real time to all peoples who have to claim to land wanted by a corporate expansion. 
First Nations are simply the first obvious ones. Vulnerable to the results of corporate greed, Canada's reluctance to change course for its people signals the intent of a crime that brings no change in the future. I know it sounds harsh, but there is no way around this. There is no way. You cannot survive in this way. You can't. This was never going to work here. Never going to work here. Not on this continent. It can't work this way. And of course, the greed behind it all. Canadian mining companies are doing the exact same thing everywhere they've gone. We are seeing the corporate takeover of this planet. That's it. It's not new, this takeover. But let's walk through it a little bit. This is a war that will not make the headlines. Not ever. And we'll go a little bit place to place to place so you'll understand what I'm talking about. Five million people dead in the Congo because of a corporation. Now, going back in time, realize that this number, this number of the five million in the Congo, 2005, for greed. Now, the story of war and plunder in the Congo it's not completely unreported. It's a story that has been censored, manipulated, covered up. Plenty of information has been published about the war in the Congo. Plenty of this is flack, designed to white out the truth, forget the pun, and help keep the real story buried. And that includes the truly honest representations of war and suffering in the Congo that have been published. Just because the mainstream doesn't cover it doesn't mean it didn't happen. This is the falsification of consciousness here. And while the death toll in the Congo over the past series of wars, for the Congonese it is a long continuous war. We will never know those numbers. Statistically, there is no recounting the ordeal of millions and millions of people who have disappeared into swamps, into tropical forests, the mass graves, the torture chambers, the death camps, or after crossing borders. The entire exercise in counting the dead is another way, though, to do little to stop it. It's about profit. But that's not all. This is another one of America's secret war. Now amongst the trustees are the overseers of the International Rescue Committee. One of which, the never dying man, Henry Kissinger. Man whose interests run very deep in the Congo. He is tied to Freeport, McMoran, I think it's called FXC. It's about copper and cobalt, basically. These are the administrators of the invasions of Rwanda and the then Congo Zaire. Same guys. It's about gold. And usually comes with the military based conservation organizations like Africa Wildlife Foundation, Washington, D.C., 
backed mercenary activities in the Congo's mountains under the cover of some sort of guerrilla protection. Will we ever get free of these beings? I don't know. I can't see it. If anything, these are the true merchants of death. This is corporate, financed, holocaust going on on this planet right now as we speak. Now we'll go back again to this war in the Congo that has been splashed in world headlines and same old cliches about violence and suffering are repackaged and rebroadcast as news. Meanwhile, early indications out of America that president-based killers are on the way. It's always been the same. Giant corporations are squeezing us dry. And they go from country to country to country, rapage, pillage, plunder. 